Good evening, and welcome to the Hero's Breath podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Huddle. And Tom Zasinski. I'm a neurofeedback technician. I also do a lot of nutritional counseling. I used to do a little personal training mm. here and there. But lifestyle coach and all around good guy. Now starting also to get into instructing people on meditation, different meditation styles. Tom and I were both focused on our personal development, heroesbreath.com. Uh, for more information on exactly what Hero's Breath is, why the Hero's Journey is so important. We'll get into that throughout this podcast, throughout each and every episode, but you can always check out the website for more information, more links to social media. I want to give a big shout out and thank you to our sponsor, the Phi Center of Manhasset. Phi is spelled P-H-I, so standing for Primary Holistic Integrative Center. We provide a lot of different modalities, Mm -hmm. uh, helping people really attain better levels of health, achieve optimal wellness through mm -hmm. every means. Uh, we have an acupuncturist on hand. We do neurofeedback as well. Uh, it's part of my work uh, in neuromeditation even. Um, so combining all these different modalities. You're, you're, you're a prime candidate. Yes, I am. You've been doing neurofeedback for a little while and you've seen... A few months. The neurofeedback so far has been amazing. I'm just working on re-uploading the my neurofeedback logs. Typically you're not supposed to see any results really on neurofeedback within the fif first 15 to 20 sessions, mm -hmm. but uh, because of some of my mental health disorders that I've been managing for the last almost 20 years, I've learned methods of monitoring my behavior, my thoughts, and my mood. So I was actually started to see results fairly quickly. Small changes that have grown rapidly in my time since I've been doing the neurofeedback for the last few months. I can say it's an amazing program. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that people go to the website. Tom, the website? phy.nyc. phycenter.nyc. Ph phycenter.nyc. Uh, we will, of course, have links on the, uh, on, on the website itself at heroesbreath.com. There will be links, of course, to the Phi Center that you can find. That's all the housekeeping out of the way. A little yeah. bit about us. We'll get into us later. We're not nearly as important as the work of the hero's journey itself. And how that applies to all of you. It is a universal story. If you've ever sat down in a movie, you've paid a lot of money, especially one of those big budget action films, and you're left thinking that, I don't know, I feel like I saw this movie before. Uh, and you say that every single time, well, there's a reason for it. And that's because stories have always served a purpose. They weren't just always to entertain. Thousands of years ago, we sat around the campfires, the elders of the tribe, the shaman, the chiefs, the, the wise ladies, everybody s told a story. And the tribe member, the members of the tribe didn't just sit there and listen, they participated. As they got older, kids were all, came into certain rites, they went through certain levels of development, and then they became more of the story. And people grew that way, cultures grew that way, societies grew that way. At some point, and Campbell talked about this a lot, that we stopped doing that and we started having more problems in society. And as long as cultures and societies integrated themselves into their stories, into their mythologies, you know, there's a lot of comparisons between the old times and our time and people kind of look back at our ancestors and think they're just a bunch of primitives who didn't know anything. Well, they didn't have HDTV, but they seem to know a lot more about the soul, about consciousness. About the human psyche. Exactly. And they didn't have the same language, but they coded it into their stories. Yes. We're going to take a quick overview today. This is podcast number one. The date is Tuesday, October 9th, and we are going to start breaking down the hero's journey, but tonight is just going to be an overview of the 17 phases that Campbell broke down, which were separated into three acts. And we're just going to keep going around this cycle because it is not linear as many people think. Mm -hmm. It is a cycle just like our lives themselves. And oftentimes we're found in these cycles and we find that there are cycles within cycles, mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. cycles, you know. So like the Mayan calendar. Absolutely. Smaller and bigger gears of time lock mm -hmm. into each other. With Joseph Campbell, who, by the way, authored uh, The Hero of a Thousand Faces. Oh, man, and I didn't even mention the book. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, that's a very great starting point for every one of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, start with the book. Start with the book. book. It is the book. It um, is the because book. Because it is the story of all of us, really. If we look at any, any culture, any tradition, any mm. philosophy, what we're finding is these very common motifs that seem to just replicate themselves throughout time. It's a story that we've all seen, we've all known, because we've been listening to stories since we've been children. Yeah. You know, we believed them more when we were children. Oh yeah, big time. 
And so what happens is, you know, this is sort of something that's been ingrained inside each and every one of us. It's been embedded inside of us, but it's also something that we're almost born with. <coughs> you and I, I think we're both pretty Jungian in mm -hmm. terms of oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the way we approach things. There is this collective unconsciousness um, that we all kind of tap into, mm. that we're all born with. And it seems to just be embedded inside of our psyche. I would also say it permeates mm -hmm. our world and that's going to lead us right into uh, act one stage one the first act of the hero's journey is separation mm -hmm. it's equilibrium or the familial world the familiar world mm -hmm. so this is where the hero starts this is Luke on his uncle's farm yeah this is Neo in the city this is the hobbits in the Shire this is where the hero starts on the journey and there's always going to be this it's the known, it's the familiar. It's the known, it's the familiar. But I like what you had said, and this is why I, I, I thought it made a good segue, is this, this idea that the great human story mm -hmm. is also told within each of us. Yeah. If I had understood this years ago, a lot of the problems that I came into, especially you know with drinking, it wouldn't have happened. I would have had more context. So that's a big number one reason why I started this company and you know we're doing this podcast and everything else initially when the hero starts in their familiar world they may or may not know there's more for them out there mm -hmm. and that leads right away into the next stage which is the call to adventure right it's either something acts on the hero or something comes up from within the hero there's always the sense that whether the forces come from without, there's still something calling the hero from within. It's always an impetus, uh, an yeah. impetus to leave, right? Mm -hmm. And so me, I always, of course, approach it from uh, religious mythology, okay. because it's something I studied as an undergrad, you know, uh, world religion. So mm -hmm. if I look at someone like Shadartha Gautama, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or the Buddha, he was sheltered his entire life, yeah. you know? I mean, his father was given a prophecy right at the, right at the start, you know, yeah. like your son's either gonna be this great, you know, king this ruler of people this ruler of kingdoms you know or he's going to be a great holy man and so of course his father just <laughs> trying to keep him happy and mm -hmm. build in his pleasure quarters within the castle away from anything that he might even be perceived as suffering you know yeah. so he was never exposed to those things and yet one day he's out and about and he experiences all these different things he, he sees death he sees old age and sickness and pain that stirs him, that, that stirs part. him. And so he wasn't immediately driven to want to leave, right? But at, at the same time, he was he, he wanted to step There's outside something the castle. Inside, There's this yeah. some internal drive yeah. that, that, that kind of wanted, that drove him to leave the castle grounds to, and then be exposed to these things, which then provoked and incited all of these questions like, why, why, why? What can I do to alleviate this? Ultimately, he leaves. He goes on his own hero's journey. Like, this is part of growing up. Right. You know, we want to move outside of the known. There's always a drive that. There's a fire inside of yeah. us. There's, there's fuel. It just needs a match. Yeah. I mean, this is going to tie straight into to number uh, the, three. Refuse the call, re refusal to call. Which is optional. It doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Like, Luke refused the call, Neo refused the call. Um, I think Frodo hesitated for like what a minute and a half. There's always some hesitation. There's some hesitation, there's but yeah. that isn't really the refusal of the call. Mm -hmm. Like Frodo's a great example of somebody who never said no. Frodo was ready to go and and took off. Now his uncle Bilbo, in the Hobbit story, he said no like several times. And for the sake of clarity, we're probably going to reference a lot of stories lot. and mythology. I was just going to say that. And you're going to find that everything we <laughs> mentioned, there will be some commonalities. And there yes. will be stories that you will connect to and resonate with. Right. And will recognize. Guaranteed. And so just try to take what we're saying and apply these pieces mm -hmm. to the things that you are familiar with. Uh, the one thing I'm pretty sure you will almost not hear on this podcast are sports references. <laughs> <laughs> Number four. For uh, my one of my personal favorite stages, uh, the last stage in the first act is supernatural aid or meeting the mentor. It depends on mm -hmm. uh, how it's often referenced. I have a lot of gratitude to the mentors I've met, to the tools I've been given in Lord of the Rings, where Frodo was given Sting from his uncle Bilbo, mm -hmm. gave him the sword, yes. a sword that could detect elf blood. That was a tool. That was aid. 
who came from his mentor. The Lord of the Rings especially is a great example about talking about mentors. Everyone always talks about Gandalf the Grey, the wise wizard. But people forget that supernatural aid and the mentor, one's an object, one's a person. Now in our modern day, it's not too often that people hand us really nice swords. I mean, that would be nice, I think. It's sometimes just simple advice, mm -hmm. a word, a note, a reference to a really awesome podcast. Hint, hint. Hint, hint. <laughs> Share with your friends. It's anything that helps the hero start on their journey. Yeah. Yeah, and it's often, it's, it's when we're hesitating. It's when we're at that point of decision. You know, when it, it can be often tied to the refusal to call, right? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. Because sometimes it, it, it that's follows, what you right? needed to get you over exactly. that hump. Exactly. You may very well be familiar with the idea of the secret. Now we're not going right. to dive too too deeply into that. But the idea behind that is simply this: you have an idea of what it is you need to achieve, mm -hmm. and then you subconsciously just start to notice things more clearly, more yes. vividly, that actually push you in the direction that you want to be right. going. And it always shows up just when you need it. And this is one of those things that um, people argue about a lot sometimes when they're breaking down Campbell's analysis. I've seen on a lot of different videos they've talked about when supernatural aid really appears. And mm -hmm. the answer is always, always. Always. And it will happen throughout the journey. I didn't really get into the Hunger Games mm -hmm. too much, but the Mockingjay pin mm -hmm. that she gets at the very, very beginning, it was just some little trinket. But without that trinket, she wouldn't have gotten help along the way. Mm -hmm. That trinket, did that little badge, that little pin, did nothing else for her except put her in contact with other people along the journey. And sometimes it's just that, it's that link. Sometimes it's a person that's that link. Mm -hmm. We all know that one person is like the hub who just knows everybody. And that is what's going to get you beyond stage five act two. Once you start to leave your world, you have to go into the initiation. And the first stage in that is stage five, which is crossing the first threshold. This is the point of no return. This mm -hmm. is the red pill. Is Buddha leaving the castle? Yeah. He's saying, no, I'm going to now leave this place of comfort, this place of, you know, familiarity thing that I've always known, and I'm going to venture out. In us, in our day to day lives, mm -hmm. what does that look like? It's a, it's, it's a high schooler leaving to go to college. Mm -hmm. The hero's journey, again, is cyclical. You know, we're going to be consistently, constantly yeah. uh, crossing thresholds into new, 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 new areas, new ventures, new ideas, new, new jobs, anything, you name it. I'm thinking of a threshold that I had to deal with, that a lot of people have to deal with, that Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, mm -hmm. talks about a lot, is about the, the opinions of other people, specifically mm -hmm. our family and our close loved ones. There's a lot of people out there, how many people do you know personally who went into a job because their parents told them to? And they didn't feel like having that fight. 95%. If you really strip it all away, strip, and this is why I resonate so much with Campbell's work, because mm -hmm. if you go, you look at the symbols and you understand what they imply, what they mean at a deeper core level, mm -hmm. you realize it's all this same fucking thing. Excuse my French, but it's all <laughs> the same thing. I By the mean, way, we curse a lot here too. <laughs> <laughs> Oftentimes, these institutions, these structures are just means that shelter you, that mm -hmm. keep you from direct full experience of the divine, right? Yes. Well, maybe if we, we really steer off the road right now and start talking about maybe just for a moment of psychedelics, well, what does it do? It, in a lot of cases, it allows for a complete ego dissolution, right? Yeah. What is that ego when you let go? That is the crossing the threat. Crossing, mm -hmm. ugh, so many SHS sounds. <laughs> crossing the threshold, right? In a lot it's of different ways one. in that way, allowing for that to dissolve and suddenly you don't exist. That, that gives people the chills, and that leads right into stage six, which is belly of the whale or road of trials. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's separated in an analysis. This is the initial test. This is, and also the failure. In this part of the, of the journey, this is where, um, in Star Wars, they got sucked into the Death Star. But this is the initial failures. This is also the first time you're going to start to meet new allies. Mm -hmm. This is in Lord of the Rings. This is where they met Aragorn. You're going to fail. You're going to get scuffed up. You're, you're going to come damn close to death sometimes. But that's oh, where yeah. you're going to meet the best people who you could not do the rest of the journey without. I feel like a very quick read for anybody who wants to just kind of follow along this. Um, read The Alchemist for those of you. Who have. Oh! Yes. Read The Alchemist yes. because that is a perfect illustration of what, what one we're of the talking best books, about. one of um, the best books ever. 
And that encapsulates the whole human whole, uh, human uh, journey. There's almost no violence in the book. I mean, the kid gets beaten up a few times. What kid doesn't? <laughs> but there's almost no violence in the book, but it's like just as gripping as uh-huh. if everyone had a knife to their throat the whole time. Yeah. We were talking about the uh, the first initial test, the, tr- the failures, you yeah. know? And I'm thinking of that scene in the marketplace where he yeah. gets scammed, you know? Yes. He just loses his life. Everything. Because- and you know it's just one of those things but it definitely also pushes the story forward like this mm-hmm. is the thing like when we say initial failures initial tests right like it's in quotations because a lot of time like we need to experience this in order to get further in that's why i use the word initial you're gonna fail a lot you're gonna this fail is what a lot. every and to bring this to business this is what every entrepreneur keeps saying you have to fail more times than the average person mm-hmm. has tried before you can even begin to see some things come back. If I took more, more, if I listened to more people and actually started blogging and vlogging and doing all the stuff 10 years ago, I'd be where, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk is because I would, and that's simply not, not to brag on me, that's just time. It's time. It's just time. For most people, that's all it is. And that's what people don't realize. Yeah. And that's why the belly of the whale road of trial, stage six, is so important, especially if you're an entrepreneur listening. But the thing is, the beauty is, the more we learn to fail, the more we learn to face failure, the more we comfortable we become with it. And guess what? You are then more likely to want to take more risks because you can get comfortable with discomfort. Even though I'm not in that crowd, but those pickup artists, mm-hmm. they talk so many times about figure on getting a no before you go up there. Yeah. And not in the, oh, she's probably going to say no to me when I go up to that chick. Not that. Mm-hmm. Figure that she's most likely going to shoot you down. And when you go into an encounter with a woman in that kind of mentality, it doesn't hurt as much. No. And that's the segue right into stage seven when you are meeting with the goddess. And this is at that point, usually in the journey, where there's the first, after the first round of trials, there's the first resting period. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about this. Well, really, he references Young or who is referenced by Campbell. So these, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like the holy trinity of all this philosophy. The feminine is the expression of nature. Mm-hmm. Nature most, awfully, most often represents herself in a feminine way. And so when you're meeting with a goddess, you're meeting with the positive aspect of life. As Jordan Peterson says, you know, humans would be nicer to the earth if it wasn't trying to freaking kill us all the time. <laughs> uh, but that's just earth's nature. It's not malicious. Yeah. We know this. When the positive side of, of, of life now is coming at us, She's bringing warmth, she's bringing nurturing, she's bringing healing. Healing, food, nourishment, water, you yeah. name it. You know, you leave the ordinary world, you come into the special world, and you need to connect with it in some way. Mm-hmm. That's what sexual intercourse really is. You know, in turn, if you're looking at it from the male perspective, it's men connecting with the feminine side of nature. Yes. Uh, and that feminine side rising up, or naturally feminine is earth, it's, it's water, it's yin. It doesn't act until it's acted upon. So the male, the fire, the air, it acts upon the natural side, the feminine side. Side. One of my favorite movies, it's, in fact, if you're watching the highlights, it's up there on the wall. Uh, it's where Neytiri in Avatar starts to familiarize Jake Sully with Pandora. Mm-hmm. Teaches him the ways of the earth, of the planet, and it's it's a very intense part. It's a very long, drawn out. It, I mean, you could think of it as almost its own mini hero's journey within that movie, where he goes from this, like, you know, clueless human in, a, in an alien body to being a, a member of the tribe. But that's only, that's actually still just that resting part mm-hmm. of the hero's journey. It's just really stretched out and dragged on in that film. It isn't until later on that everything else uh, gets compressed at the end and it made right. it so intense. And just for the sake of clarity here, we're not talking male and female agenda-wise, we're talking about the male and Energy. female within each and every single one of us. Yes. So this applies to every single human being. And honestly, in your own journey, or sometimes in films, mm-hmm. the, the, the meeting with the goddess actually is a male. Yes. It's because he's the guy who is like, oh, here's a bottle of whiskey, pour that on your wound. Like, that's actually the meeting with the goddess stage right, of right. the hero's because, journey. Because the idea behind it is the uh, rest. The, what, the rest. And the, the healing. nurturing. Yes. Right, which is the, like you pointed out, the yin part of the thing. But like women, it could flip. <laughs> it usually <laughs> does. Stage eight, women, woman as temptress. That is where the flesh starts to become tempted, mm-hmm. really, for the first time. This is sometimes this is often represented as a sexual temptation. That was the typical way that this stage is represented, but it could also just be the temptation of rest. Mm-hmm. And sometimes there's even a chance at this stage to go back yes. 
without completing the journey. And at this stage, you can even rationalize it to yourself. In Avatar, just before he was going to make that connection with and become a full member of the tribe, Quaritch comes to him and said, we got all the data we need, we got all the information we need, we don't need you in there anymore. Why don't I ship you home and they can restore your spine and you can have your old life back on Earth. This is what he came to Pandora for originally. There's all the rationalization to stop. In that case, it's always it's not just the physical flesh, it's also just the weakness of the flesh. It's not just sex, it's satiation mm -hmm. and personal gratification. If I'm thinking about the optimist. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, when he's in the he desert, was... in the oasis, mm -hmm. right? And he meets the girl. He meets the girl and suddenly him going to find his treasure, seek his treasure in the pyramids, is no longer as important. Like, but that wasn't the first time he was yeah. tempted to, to stay or turn back. Very true. When he was in the in the uh, the, the the shop, yeah, the crystal shop, mm -hmm. that was another change. He had to go back, and he made the, the 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 trek out into the desert where he met the the woman in the oasis. Yes, very true. So, and so it's it comes around. It's and it's cyclical again. We're yeah. going to keep coming back to this idea that is it happens repeatedly. Yes, hell, even Jesus had to deal with it. I mean, he's out in the desert for forty <laughs> days and nights. You know, I mean, he's meditating like a pro. But he must have been like so a champ, he man. must have been so hard in keto at that point. <laughs> I would want to test his ketones. I want to know what the hell those were. He has kingdoms flung at him. Mm -hmm. By the negative side of the in aspect, and this is something Jung and and Peterson talk a lot it's about. Delusion. Is that right? Is there that positive and negative side? And I mean in the literal sense, not in the good bad sense, but in the one is ascending, one is descending. The ascending consciousness yes. towards higher enlightenment. And then you have all these demons dragging you down. In the Christian context in the Bible, it's the devil trying to tempt Jesus with all the, the kingdoms of the earth and the pleasures of the, of the flesh. And for the Buddha, it happens with, with just throngs and throngs of demons. And, and, and I think it's interesting, we, we seem to naturally contrast um, Jesus and the Buddha here because in stage nine, which is atonement with the Father, we're dealing with authority. In both cases, really, you know, like especially in Jesus' case, the devil offered him all the kingdoms of the world. I rule this planet, you could have it. You could be my right hand. You know, so there was this idea of us usurpation of the yin over the yang, which is something we were talking about before. Right. How certain political factions, socio-political factions, have thrown the balance off, mm -hmm. and it's not benefiting anyone. Right. Uh, so there was that theme thousands of years ago already. Confronting the source of ultimate power in your life, it's usually represented as a father. Star Wars is a great example, but it's dealing with the trope of the shadow self as well. Mm -hmm. That's why Luke went into the cave. George Lucas, hands off, hats off to him. That was a brilliant piece of writing. Oh, yeah. It seemed so pointless when I was a kid. Once I started studying this stuff, I'm just like, Phew. What you just said, like, we, we watched this as children, right? And there is so much lost on us. I just want to see more space battles. What the fuck is he doing in a cave? Right? I love the laser fights, you know? Yeah, like, yeah show me I, the pew I, pew. <laughs> Another reference, and it was made in this... Um, this great video that I saw that I'm going to throw the link up to on the website in Spider-Man 3, which a lot of us try not to mention too much. <laughs> as bad as that movie was, there was a lot of great symbolism in it. And dealing with the, the black suit, mm -hmm. the way it altered his personality, the way he finally tore it off and confronted it and all that other stuff. That was actually a really important trope that was brought in. And believe it or not, him dealing with that part of himself was the atonement with the father. And it requires an immense letting go. Oh, huge. Our hero, you whoever it is this is the point of absolute humbleness so you have to be driven down into the ground into the dirt you know and you have to let go you have to relinquish all power you have to accept you know and this is where true transformation occurs precisely what ties us into stage 10 yeah yeah apotheosis which in latin means to make divine yeah. And this is where the hero transcends to a higher plane through a death and rebirth kind of scenario oftentimes. I think the best, personally for me, is when Gandalf the Grey comes back as Gandalf the White mm -hmm. after defeating the Balrog. It's a catharsis that leads to a full breakthrough where it really is is maturity. Because you're realizing the divine within yourself. This is, like I said, we were going to get to this. What Jordan Peterson says when he's talking about the, the, the Christian faith mm -hmm. is that there's a lot, especially for, from Jesus' mouth, talking about shattering all paradigms, mm -hmm. shattering ignorance. That ego, like you were talking about, it doesn't want to let go. No. That's why in the in the stories in the Gospels, talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees, they didn't want to let their old establishment order go. 
That's why they pressured the Romans into crucifying him. He challenged the initial system and it was the representation of that ego, like mm -hmm. you said. And that's where the apotheosis becomes so important and why there's so many things going on with it. I, I would say the, the most complicated one. And one of the most important. I mean, this is this is the this is where we experience true transformation. This is yeah. this is often where you know the treasure is almost found, you know, because it, it, it's at this right point, before it. Yeah, you know, it's it, it's at this point where we're coming into a new stage, into a new way of being, yeah. into new aware, uh, new consciousness, new awareness, you know, and so all the lessons that we've learned up until now, you know, this is where we've been brought to, and so and we have to be willing to let it all go. It's saying that. I know there's more going on, especially when there is that like impetus to adventure and that supernatural age shows up mm -hmm. in just the right way that it almost feels to the audience like this is either lazy writing or there's some sort of big oversight over all of this. The uh, that will be done, you know, moment. The, the model for Western civilization is a man unfairly, you know, nailed to a cross. It had to happen. And that is what brings on the ultimate boom, which is stage 11. This is where, after the apotheosis, after you get that divine um, power, uh, that's where you actually use it to finish the task. And that's where the hero fulfills their destiny and finds clarity. That's where, the, the, that's where Luke uses the force instead of the targeting computer, is the result of the apotheosis, is when you get that godlike power and you use it to, to, to finish the task, to, to pick up the object that you need, the treasure, uh, to defeat the bad guy, that's that moment. And that's the moment you really feel from the beginning has tied to the end. Then there's three more optional parts to this. Stage 12, 13, and 14 is the refusal of the return, the magic flight, and the rescue from without. That there's a catharsis combined with sheer exhaustion that can sometimes just leave the hero done. Like when Frodo was like about to let himself fall into Mount Doom and Sam was not letting him go. But is also this kind of knowledge of the hero that all the stuff I've just done and I'm going to go back to my normal life. It's like uh, in the end of the Hurt Locker, Jeremy Renner's character just goes yeah. back to, you know, back to the, to the battle zone because what the hell else is he going to do? About a year ago, I read uh, Tribe by Sebastian Junger. It comes down to purpose. You know, we, we're, we're, we're purpose driven. We seek it out, you know, and if we come back suddenly, okay, my, my, my journey's done. Especially in the military, you know, it's they're coming very back hard. to to a world that doesn't a appreciate them, <clears throat> That's and true. b where they, they suddenly feel like there's nothing for them to do to accomplish. There's no mission. They yeah. go back, yeah. you know, because that's where they had their purpose. They had their band of brothers. They had their community that they belong to. We crave belonging, and we don't yeah. have it in our culture. Otherwise, it's very flat. And, and again, this is an optional phase, as is the stage thirteen, which is magic flight. Sometimes you gotta you, you rip the treasure out of the god's throne room and you gotta fucking haul ass. G jet. Right? Yeah. Here's where lazy writers will throw in a Deus Ex Machina moment, where yeah he rolls his eyes. It's just when the hero uses up all their strength and resources. You know, last bullets fired and the zombies are surrounding them. It's like how the hell do you get out of this situation? Mm -hmm. When Han uh, takes the shot in the trench. Or when the eagles come for the hobbits on Mount Doom, they call it a deus ex machina moment. That's also kind of part of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. It's not always lazy writing to do something like that. It's part of the journey. I want to make sure everybody understands that. Stage 14 sometimes has to happen. So give writers out there a little bit more credit. We deserve it, okay? That leads into the, the real meat of the matter. The return. The return. Act three, the return. All three acts are separation, initiation, and return. Or SIR, if you want to use any acronyms. Stage 15, crossing the return threshold. The hero has figured out, well, I got to do this. I got to see this through to the very, very end. And that's where they return back to their ordinary world mm -hmm. with the power to fix the problem. Mm -hmm. um, this is after a symbolic revival from death, uh, the complete with the elixir, with the knowledge in hand. In classical literature, this is where Odysseus fends off his wife's suitors mm -hmm. and pulls, you know, draws the bow that no one else could draw and, and takes the, the, the shot and his sons help fend everything off and there's just one more great battle. And it doesn't always have to be that way. The perfect contrast is when the hobbits return to the Shire and nobody gave a shit. It was horrible. And to me, that was the most horrific scene of the entire trilogy. The moments like that, I'm like, all right, Tom, that's that's that, that's your ego talking. That's pride right there. You got you got to tone that shit exactly. down. Exactly. And you know what? It's not even so much for like you know acknowledgement or having a ticker tape parade. Yeah. 
but it's just a matter of what a fucking letdown. Matrix Trilogy, as much as people like to bash the last two films, in stage 16, you're the master of both worlds. And in Neo's case, I, what the Wachowski siblings did was actually kind of interesting. He really wasn't the master of both worlds. He was only really the master of one. He was master of the digital world yeah. until at the end of the second film, when he really does become master of the digital world and the, phys the robots of the physical world. Mm -hmm. So there, so they kind of really took that master of both worlds thing and just like and like expanded on it, which I thought was actually kind of brilliant. This is where the hero overcomes the shadow self, pulls out the inner divinity, walks between what Peterson talks about that boundary between order and chaos, where meaning mm -hmm. is found. Like you talked about, Siddhartha's story is perfect for this. He would choose enlightenment. Oh yeah, like shit. He could have just stayed there in perfect bliss, but what did he choose to do? Eventually, you know, like it yeah. wasn't immediate, but like people found him out. They saw him. Sometimes the hero achieves the, 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 the ideal, the object, whatever it is. Right. So cycles within cycles. You know, maybe something will be there to push him to, okay, now you got to come back. You got to share yeah. your knowledge, share your medicine, share, share whatever your, it share is. Because ultimately, we're, we're communal beings. You know, mm -hmm. we, don't, we, mm -hmm. we cannot mm -hmm. exist as an island. We can't exist in isolation. Right you know? away, you're making me think of Salk. Who yeah. developed the polio vaccine? You know what? That's a story I think people need to develop. Why the hell isn't that like a movie, at least an indie film, uh, where he develops the polio vaccine and doesn't patent it? He knows he has to give it away. Throwing this out to Hollywood, how about instead of rehashing the same old bullshit, you tell that story? Get uh, Benedict Cumbersnatch or whatever on it. All right, but he's a great fucking actor. I love he's him. an amazing fucking <laughs> actor. Last stage is the freedom to live. Mm -hmm. Stage 17, the hero isn't just liberated from external oppression, but from internal as well. He lives in the present, accepts reality as it is without judgment, and lives without fear. And this is incredibly significant because it means that when the next cycle comes around, he'll be more prepared for it than the first time, mostly because by this point, the hero usually knows this isn't gonna stop. This is going to happen again and again and again. And really the Matrix is the best example, I think, of this in cinema is it's where Smith overtakes Neo at the very end of the last movie and Neo then use, becomes Smith, but then cleanses the matrix of Smith. Christ overcame death by dying. I found this quote by uh, Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, uh, who said, the fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. And this is what Peterson said that night we saw him. That resonated with me when he mm -hmm. said it. It struck a chord. Bringing this back to entrepreneurship. Get the hell out there. Like Gary Vaynerchuk says, he, he wishes entrepreneurship wasn't so sexy right now. Mm -hmm because there are people who are literally killing themselves over this stuff. Entrepreneurship is for people who don't want to live by anyone else's terms but their own. So you have to go through this hero's journey this entire time, go through many iterations, go through many, many failures, but in the end, it's not about houses and watches and cars and mistresses and boats and planes, it's about freedom. Mm -hmm. It's about that freedom to live and you have to go through all this shit in between. It's endemic to every single one of us. Boom. You know? That's thank you. That's the word. We're all seeking that freedom, and the thing is, where where is it found right now, in the present right. moment? And that's something men don't do very well. The reason we 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 talk a lot from the male perspective, it's not just because we are men, is because in talking about again the aspects of yin and yang, aspects of male and female, the female is nature. The female yep. is the present moment. The male is consciousness. Yeah, for those who are interested, just, 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 yeah, just throw just, it out here. Yeah. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna recommend you read David Data. I knew you were going there. I, mean, I was going to give you a moment to do that. <laughs> I'd be like, and now pitch the book. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm telling you, he, he really goes so well into this topic. It's just, yeah. just these very ideas right now that we're talking about. Um, what is it? The Way of the Superior Male? The uh, Way of the Superior Man. Man. And you turned me on to that book, so thank you. Let's not get too immersed into talks of gender, right? right. But just, let's just that. focus on masculinity and femininity and right. accept that every single one of us embodies this. Some will obviously embody the masculine more, more than the feminine. Than another, and so we have than these energies inside body. of us. And so, yeah. so we're, we're throwing that out there now just for the sake of clarity, yeah. you know, so that way we're not getting- Because we're gonna speak our own language to each other. Yes. We wanna make sure we're, that everyone's on the same We're page. trying to qualify the language that we're using right now. That, that's a good point. So, so women live in the present moment and men don't. It's exactly yes. like you said, we need to try. So it's the male drive, it's the, it's the consciousness. Mm -hmm in men and women to try to be present. Yes. Nobody's present. But people don't understand. The whole point of meditation is so that you can learn to be present in the moment. It's like me as a Pilates instructor, I don't, I tell my clients this all the time. 
you go to a trainer and learn to train for an hour, but you're not often leaving with much, unless you're with a really good trainer. For Pilates, it's about learning how to use your body so when you leave the studio, you don't hurt yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can get better. It's not just about long and lean and trim and, and everything else. It's about having less back pain, having less neck pain. The idea here and the idea behind this podcast, we're going to start wrapping this up, is that we want you to get the tools you need, the mental tools, the, the supernatural aid mm -hmm. that you need so that you're not as inhibited the next call, on the next call to adventure. It will keep calling on you until you fucking do it. And if you don't, you will die an NPC. That is gamer lingo for non-playable character. And I'll tell you something right now, my friends. Drive by your local cemetery. You will see a lot of NPCs in there. Is you see a lot of people who went to their graves, who did not answer the call, who did nothing with their lives, who fulfilled their societal roles, and never did anything that would have enriched society, that would have enriched their own lives. It's a win-win. You it's enrich stagnation. yourself. It's, it's stagnation. stagnation. It's not what nature wants to do. Yep. It needs to be acted upon by human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, everything sits and just dies. Yeah. So we're begging you pretty much here in podcast number one, listen to the call. Take action. Answer that call. And whatever we can do, we will help you in every single way. We're not just doing this because we like hanging out. We, we do like hanging out. We like hearing each other talk. Yeah. We like bouncing shit off each other. It's always a great conversation with him. But this is for you. So when you go to heroesbreath.com, you go check out media, you'll be able to follow me. I will throw up on Instagram as many memes, as many encouraging things that I can. Uh, and I will throw as many links as I can to in other encouraging, inspiring advice to other people to follow. And Tom, I know, you, I know you're down for the same, eh? I'm, I'm driven to help others live, honestly, live a life of purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we need. And this is why I feel like anxiety, depression, and all these other mood disorders and psychological issues are a result of that. Yeah. Just a lack of purpose, you know, a lack of fear. Okay, you're not just doing it for you, you're doing it for the world, you're doing it for the people around you, you're doing it for the family. You know, you have to show up as the true you, you know, the ultimate you. And they may not like that at first. Not at first, but you know what, they will. <laughs> Eventually, they you know, because you show up 100%, you change yourself, you change the world around you. If it happens and you listen to that true self and you and you go on that journey, you meet those mentors, yeah, you you And we're here to give you, the, give you that push, take the risk. Fail a few times if you need to fail, and then come back and fail learn. Fail more than a few times. Trust me, it's good. <laughs> More than better. <laughs> Believe me, I'm a fucking expert at this. But familiarize yourself with it, and yeah. be open to it, and pursue it. You know, yes. yeah, you're, you're gonna fall, you're gonna Look get for it. it. You, you will enter the valley of death more than once. But you know what, you will come, and <clears throat> I'm telling you that, that view when you come up on top is so much better. I wanna thank you all for tuning in. Hope you have a fantastic evening. We look forward to talking to you again really soon. Pick up a copy of The Alchemist. <laughs> and The Way of the Superior Man. And 12 Rules for Life. There and The Hero with a Thousand Faces. That would and, be a good starting point. <laughs> and check out HeroesBreath.com for more information. Good night, everybody. Good night.